SFB Addict here with uh, video number two for the Idiot's Guide on how to make a Vassal module. So the first video we uh, went over these first four items which do not exist on the right click menu for adding. So if we right click, the very first item we have is Add Map Window, which is this, your main map or map window. Now you can have multiple map windows and you can have multiple boards. Now one of the reasons you might have multiple boards is let's say you're doing an adventure game. You play on one board, and then you play on another board, and then you play on another board. That's one way to do it. Um, another one is to have a main playing board, and then you might have another board which only contains a deck of cards, like Community Chest, or you might have another board which only contains money, like the uh, user rule for uh, free parking and Monopoly kind of thing. Um, now if I take a quick look here at my Starfleet Battles module and I come up to my main map and open it up, you'll see that I've got multiple boards. And basically what you do is you right click and you can add your items. Okay, so let's start with the very first item, Add Overview Window. Now what this does is it gives you a very small window that gives you an overview of your entire map. So if you have a really huge map that can't all fit on the screen at once, this is how you take a quick look at that big map as a small little square. So that's why you've got a scale factor here of 0.19. You can of course change the, the scale factor. And of course, this is what you do for the label of the button, or the button text, or the mouse over, I should say. And then you can uh, use an icon, or use the default icon, or no icon at all. And then, of course, you've got a, a hotkey, which you can toggle on your keyboard to open and close that window. Simple enough. Now, your game piece palette. set it down here. When you add new items, I always show at the bottom. Now, I just noticed that I already have a game piece palette here, so I really didn't need to make one. You can have multiple ones if you want, so let me just delete that. So we have a game piece palette already here, and it's got a tabbed selection that I've already thrown in here. Now this is where you can have a little window that opens up, and it's where you can grab counters and drag them onto the map. Now what I've already done here is, on this menu you've got Add Tab to Panel, Add Panel, Add Pull Down, and Add Scrollable List. It's just different styles of doing this left hand window. And you can of course nest them. So I've got a tabbed panel here, and a tabbed panel here, and a tabbed panel here, which is how you get these multiple options across the top. So if I were to take this single piece, copy it, paste it, and paste it, as I click on each one, you'll see I have those available. So basically this will contain your little graphic counters. So let me just quickly delete those. So that was a, a tabbed panel. You can do a pull down menu. And I still have that piece, single piece of memory because I have selected copy. And you'll notice that when you open it, this is the annoying thing about Vassal is these slider windows often open up incredibly minimized and it'll look like nothing has happened when you toggle the piece. So whenever you click on something like that, you got to pay close attention to see if something opens minimized. You may have to drag it open. So here's the, the drop down menu. And it's only got the one item so far, the 00 image graphic for the counter. But 
I could uh, make a, a new piece. Let's do that. So let's add a single piece. And we're going to double click it. And that one's 0, 0. So I'm going to call this 0, 1. And I've got some images here. So I have a 0, 0 piece and a 0, 1 piece. So I have 0, 0 and 0, 1. Now this could be, if you're doing a war game, it could be an infantryman and it could be a tank, that sort of thing. Now, in the game piece palette, you basically got those options of style of selector, scrollable list, pull down, panel, or tabbed panel, and then you've got add single piece, add multiple piece, that's it. And then you've got your imported class, which we're ignoring because we're not Java programmers. So add single piece and add multiple piece, well, the add multiple piece is just a way of defining a bunch of them all at the same time. Edit the, t the template, it gives you the, the, the traits that you put into the current traits for the piece. And it's pretty much the same thing as the single piece where you've got the available traits and the current traits. Now, all these traits, I'm going to do a separate video for this entire selection. So that's all we really need to cover right now for the game piece palette. Now the game piece palette is similar similar, not exactly the same, uh, but similar to the game piece inventory window. But the game piece inventory window comes up in a slightly different way. So Now let's go back and let's open that up. And let's click on the help file for that. So what it does is it gives you a window like this. So when you're in the game, instead of opening on a sidebar like that, it will actually open an actual full-fledged window. So let's just click OK on that. And let's just add anything here. should be enough. Okay, now I did say it's similar but not the same. Now what it does is that when you have a bunch of pieces on the map, and uh, let's see if I can do this as a new game without a map. Yeah, there we go. It gives you that pop-up window. And I'm not sure I'm going to be able to drag this down. Yep, there we go. And if I refresh, there we go. So it gives you an inventory window of everything that's there. So it's not quite the same as grabbing a piece and adding it to the map, but it will let you list what's on the map, or what's off the map, or what's in a specific board. As, I, as we mentioned, you can have multiple game boards. So here, let me close this. So back here, if we have three game boards, you can have an inventory list for each specific board. So those are the three windows that are primarily involved with the counters. So you had your uh, game piece image definition. You then had your game piece palette. 
and then you've got an inventory window listing. Okay, now the game piece palette and the game piece prototype definitions are rather closely linked in their traits. So we have game piece prototype definitions. Now as you add pieces, so the, this is some of the couple of the pieces we've added earlier, 00 and 01. You'll notice that it's got a list of available traits and current traits, available traits, current traits. So I can define a prototype that contains a bunch of traits. So for instance, if I wanted to, I could do basic menu items. So if I want every piece that has this prototype to be able to be deleted, removed from the map, I can add delete. If I want to be able to make a copy of that piece, I can add clone. Uh, if I want to be able to label that piece, I can add text label. If I want to be able to rotate every piece, I can add that, but let's leave that off here for now. And uh, let's see, let's be able to make every piece invisible. And uh, let's add the ability to mask. And as you see, any player, any side, or any specified sides. So let's make this team one. So this is the basic menu items. So in here, on my 00, zero piece, I can say add a prototype. And I can say basic menu items. Here it is. You gotta get the, sp the spelling right. Basic menu items with an S. There we go. So now, in my zero zero piece, if I right click it, well, let's save it first. I think I had that as a small m. Let me check that. Yeah, it's got to be capital M. So this item has no way to delete it, but this one does. So since this one I had mistyped the menu, with a small m instead of a capital M, when I right click I get nothing. This on the other hand, if I right click, I get the invisible clone and delete. So I can delete this item, but I can't delete that item. So the only way to get rid of this item is to close the game. So by using the prototype with this one item, I was able to add the items of delete, clone, and invisible. And I thought I also had the ability to mask. Yep, the ability to mask. But mask isn't showing up. And that's because we didn't define our sides. I think we called it Team 1. Here we go. And we haven't 
filled in the rest of the masking. So once we finish filling in masking, let's see. So we did the team. Okay, well, we really didn't do an image. Um, maybe we'll select six. And we can just say plain, I guess, for now. And let's save. I believe we have to have a map for it. Now we're not on a side, so let's retire, become team one. And now we have the option to mask. Okay, so it's toggling to seven, not six. So that means this one is being replaced by this one. Now I haven't really played with all the, the functions of mask. So there we go. So when we use the inset option, it uses the top graphic because it's the only one there. But if we change and set this to be defined as an image, it's going to use the image that we defined down here, which we defined as image seven. So that's how those two functions will work. So it depends on what you're selecting here. Okay, so we were talking about definitions, or prototype definitions. So we've created a piece prototype for basic menu items. We could create another one. That contained movement trails. Or we could do one for an area of effect, or we could uh, do the mark when moved. We even do play a sound. Any of these options. But for now, we'll just do mark when moved. And we'll just call it moved. So as we build these pieces, we can choose to either add these prototype definitions or not. Now the supposed benefit of this is that if you have like 30 or 40 pieces, instead of adding in each one of these 30 pieces, um, the 
one, two, three, four, five traits on each of those 30 items. We just add the one prototype to each of those 30 pieces. So it's supposed to speed things up. And you can also set these up as things like uh, this prototype is going to be for all the traits that a starship should have. This next one is going to be for all the traits that a shuttlecraft should have. And the next one might be all the traits that a seeking weapon should have. So you can cluster those traits onto those definitions and then let's say you do five definitions for each one of those prototypes instead of adding five, and let's say you've got three definitions, so instead of doing five per, you're only doing, which would be 15 in total, you're only adding the three prototype definitions. So it's sort of like front loading all your traits into a prototype definition so that you can save your time when you're adding them to individual pieces later. So that's what your, your prototype definitions are about. Add a toolbar menu, simple enough. If I want a menu in here in the game window, this is how I make it. So if I want to make this uh, dice roller, Let's see, um, got to change the actual button label to dice roller to get it to show up over here. And we could add in other items over here, like uh, roll d6, roll d10. And then we could define an item for rolling a d10 and rolling a d6 and when we select the menu it, there's nothing here now because we haven't defined it but if we were to D10. So when I click the button, I get the choice of two other options. So I could have like 15 or 30 entries in here in one great big long list. And that's how you make the menus. So the add toolbar menu itself doesn't actually put anything in it, despite what you put in here, until those items are actually built with the exact same name. So this has to be proper capitalization and the exact spelling and etc. in both this little window and here for it to show up inside this dice roller window which is this item right here. So that's how you build them. Now the next item, whoops, wrong menu. The next item is a multi-action button. Now it looks the same as the toolbar button. It looks like the only difference is the label, but there is a difference. The toolbar menu gives you a list of items when you click a button. The multi-action button does not do that. The multi-action button executes everything that's listed in the order they're listed. 
So if I had roll a d6, roll a d7, roll a d8, and I click the multi-action button over here in the game window, it would roll three different dice all at once. Whereas the toolbar menu would show me the clickable buttons for the d6, d7, and the d10, or whatever. And I could select which of those three I want to execute. Now I could click it three times and select each one individually, but that takes multiple clicks, whereas the multi-action button, it's bang, one click, it all happens. And of course you can assign a hotkey to either one, so you can do it by a keyboard shortcut. So that's the difference between a toolbar menu and the multi-action button. Now the toolbar menu itself can contain other toolbar menus. So you can put in one button that then drops down to five or six other buttons, which then when you open them up, do other things. So I could create a toolbar menu that says dice, and then my first item could be d6 dice, the next item could be d10 dice, and the next item could be d20 dice. And then I could then subdivide that, so if I click on the dice and then the d6 menu, inside that menu I could then list roll 1d6, roll 2d6, roll 3d6, etc. So you can nest and make your menus. And you got your add action button. Pretty self-explanatory. Give it a label, give it a picture, give it a, a hotkey combination. You can make it display and echo a message to chat. You can play a sound. For instance, I could put in a sound clip here for a rolling die. Now you notice this doesn't actually roll the die, it just executes the sound of the dice rolling. And then I could specify a hotkey that will get executed when I click this button to play the sound. So I could put in a key here that executes the command to roll a die. And then you could do a, a repeat action. So I could say roll a dice until that die equals the result of 5. And it'll keep executing that until that condition is met. So that was your action button. And then you've got your actual die button, your dice button. This is where you would actually roll the dice. And of course you've got your hotkey here. Now this hotkey here is what actually executes the rolling of the dice. So in that action button, I could have said Alt TY. And then here I could put Alt TY. So during a game, if I hold down the Alt key and hit TY, it will then roll the 2d6 dice. And you've got other options here for the number of dice, the number of uh, sides per die. You can add a number to a die, add a number to the overall total, report the total. You can sort your, your, your results, etc. So that's your die. And then we get into add global key command or add startup global key command. Now the startup one will get executed automatically whenever you start a game. That's the difference between the two. Other than that, they're, they're the same. So global key command gives you a description. You can name it. You can set up some matching properties. You can, within a deck, apply it to all the pieces, no pieces, fixed number of pieces. Um, you can create the uh, icon for it, or here's a default icon, give it a hotkey, suppress individual formats. Now let's take a look and see what global key command says in the reference manual. Okay, so startup global key command is an extension of global key command that fires automatically upon completion of the module load. So down here is your actual global key command. It adds a button to the map window toolbar. Hitting the button will select certain pieces from the map window and apply the same keyboard command to all of them simultaneously. And then it gives an example here of clear fired status. 
So one of the functions that you can build is something that toggles a piece to being fired or not fired. And let me pull over my ADB window. And I believe I have that on my counters. as prototype fired. So if I go look at my prototypes, there's one here built or fired, and basically it is a graphic layer that puts this red graphic of fired beside a piece when I right click on a piece and toggle it to fired. So, in this example, it's a global key command that will toggle the status of any piece that's been listed as fired. So let's say on turn one, three of my five starships fire. Well, on turn two, those three starships are still listed as fired, but they're now able to fire again because it's a new turn. So you would click this button and it would clear all three of those starships of their graphic that says they have fired, and they're now back to a status of not fired. So that's an example of what a global key command is. It's something that when you click a button, it executes a, a hot key, a, a, a key command. So here it would execute the command Alt F. And in the building of that fired graphic, you would normally put in the increase level key of Alt F. So anytime you hit Alt F, it rotates between no image and the fired image, meaning attached to the counter piece. And this literally matches it over to the right hand side of the graphic. Okay, let's bring up my two little windows again. So that was your global and your startup key command. So for instance, when you first start a game, you might want to reset all the markers kind of thing. Or move all the markers back to their beginning position, something like that. Okay, add random text button. Let's take a look and see what the help file says on that. So, random text button can be used to randomly select a text message from a list of defined messages. For example, a button can be defined to select a random letter A, B, C, or D, enter each test message in a box on the left of the add button, blah, 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 blah. And of course, the example it gives here is it could be used to define dice with irregular numerical values, such as a six-sided die with the values of 2, 3, 3, 4, 4, and 5. If the values are numerical, check the faces have numeric values box, which enables the report total and add to each die option. So you can give it a name. Now, the up here getting a little bit convoluted. There we go. Just had to refresh that. Add random text. 
I'm going to call that name, I'm going to call that name 2 to show you what the difference is. So it says name 2 up here, but it says name down here. So that's the difference between your name and your button text. The button text is what shows up here, and your tooltip text is what shows up with your mouse over. Now you notice that I only put in name and name 2, I didn't touch this. So it filled in automatically. So here, it's sort of like uh, creating a die roller, but not really meant for numbers, or it's meant for kind of irregular numbers. And this is that, that thing here that it was talking about in terms of uh, add button and hit add button. That's this. <laughs> It's saying use the field to the left, it's actually above, the add button, fill in, let's say you're, we're doing add odd numbers. So there's our, our set of odd numbers according to that example. Whoops, I just hit the X button. Didn't mean to do that. But anyway, let's just quickly throw in a couple. This is, this is what I meant to do. <laughs> Drag it up. So you can see your multiple entries in here. So if you wanted to do that setup where it's odd letters or numbers kind of thing, that's how you would build it. I've never actually used this. So I haven't had a need, but that's what it's for. So that was add random text button, add symbolic dice button. Now the first half of this is pretty standard stuff. A name, button text, tool tap, tool tip. <laughs> Not talking straight today. Uh, an icon button and a hotkey. So that's pretty much standard to anything you can kind of add. And then you got your report result as text. And if you have reported as text, it's going to get echoed to chat. And there's your formats and some options. Show result in a window. Show result in a button. So let's click the help on this. And here it says a symbolic dice button is used to define dice that use arbitrary images. Each button can roll several dice represented by symbolic die components, each of which may have any number of faces represented by symbolic dice face components. When the button is pushed, a random face is selected for each symbolic die that this component contains. The result of the roll can be reported as text in the chat area or graphically in a separate window. So basically, instead of a die with numbers, it's going to be a dice with pictures and you could either have the picture show up or you could attach a text label for what that picture would be and have that echo to chat or you can do both. So if instead of the standard dice of one through six, let's say it was some sort of weird Chinese thing of uh, dragon or boat or uh, earthquake or mountain or fire, those would be the results of the die roll. So that's what a symbolic dice is. Instead of doing symbolic, they could have said picture, because symbolic kind of brings up other thinking and terminology, but that's what it is. I've never had the, the need to use this either. So you're down to symbolic dice add predefined setup. Now this is basically for save games. So if you're creating a module and you want to add predefined save games, this is where you would create the menu option. And let me bring over my ADB one. So here, whoops, wrong window. So here in the ADB cadet one, we have scenarios. Now these are predefined setup. 
So when I click one of these buttons, it loads a save game. So once your module is built, you can go in, you can make those save games, and then you come back and you put in what the name of the save game is. And you can give it a name. So mine were like scenario one, etc., blah, blah, blah. And use a predefined file. Dang, if you don't use a predefined file, <laughs> um, well, there's not much use to doing it. <laughs> you pretty much have to use a predefined file. So there you go. And just for the fun of it, let's click help and see what comes up on the menu. So predefined setup replaces the new game menu item with the file menu of the controls window with a new menu item that looks that loads a saved game that you specify in advance. Wow, that's a really convoluted way of saying you can load saved games from the menu. Now here's the use predefined file. If left unchecked, this menu entry will start a new game from scratch like the normal new game. In other words, this is exactly how the new game button is built. So it's either going to be a new game or it's going to be load a save game. Or load a predefined save game. Now they really didn't need to, to include that button. They could have simply left it as new game, load game. But of course with load game you don't get a menu to select the item from. So by having it as a predefined setup basically it lets you create a menu entry with a list. That's all it is really. So it, it is the game new game button but it lets you have a list instead of just simply using the load and then searching for the file. Okay so it's predefined setup. Now add chart window menu. Again, the standard stuff of the name, the button text, the tooltip text, and what graphic you want to use, and then a hotkey. But what happens when you actually make it? Well, it gives you the options of adding a chart, adding an HTML chart, adding a tabbed panel, pull down, scrollable list, or adding a map. Now, the add scrollable list, pull down menu, panel, and tabbed panel basically mean defines how it's going to look here. So let me do it as a uh, pull down, because pull down simple. Now you notice, remember how I said sometimes things will open up minimized and you won't even see them? So take a look over there to the left, right beside that drop down for the zero, 00. As I'm toggling this button, you'll see a very small sliver appear and disappear. Yeah, this thing right here. That's almost invisible. But anyway, we can click that, drag it over, and then grab the bottom and drag it down. So that's how it should be opening and closing. But of course, Vassal being Vassal, sometimes it's opened up at the absolute minimum. So basically it's a chart window where you can add a bunch of charts and you can have them selectable from here. So in here, in the pull down menu, I can now right click and I can say add a chart. So let's call it chart one. And then you can grab a graphic of the chart. Let's just put in the entry. And let's do another one, add chart. Let's just give it a quick two without actually grabbing a graphic or anything. So now in this drop down, I have the one or the two option. Now instead of grabbing a graphical chart, let me just grab my, my good old numbers here. Primarily because they're right there at the, the very beginning of that file or right at the beginning of that folder and they don't have to go very far to, to grab them. So you can just imagine that these graphics are charts. 
So when I select one, I get the one chart. When I select two, I get the two chart. And that's all it is. So that's what your chart window menu is. Now I didn't have to do a pull down menu at all. I could have just simply put them right at the very beginning. But as you see, I've created two here and it's only showing one. That's because I didn't really do anything in terms of how I'm going to define access. And sometimes you get odd behavior if you do things in a sloppy way like that and put them over top of one another. So I would literally have to delete that, I believe, and then re-add it. going to have to uh, close it. Just grab a 9 here, I guess. Yeah, now it's showing up. So you're really supposed to put them into either a tabbed panel panel, pull down list, or a scrollable list. So if I were to create a scrollable list, So it's remembering my nine from my previous one. This should just give you the list here on the left. But anyway. And again, a chart is a simple graphic. An HTML chart will let you load an HTML page with text and a graphic. And then you can add a map. And then you've got to define your map. Uh, and your maps, I guess, could be defined up in your main map. So let's see what happens if I change that to a 1. I've never actually used the map option before. So only imported class is the only thing there. And if I double click I get properties which is a label. But let's see. Um, there you go. Following problems were found. If not fixed they could cause bugs during gameplay. More than one map window named main map must define at least one board in main map. Cancel. I uh, thought I had something. So let's do this. So I guess this is labeling it as main map. We're not seeing it because it's in dot, dot, dot. Uh, let's see. Anyway, this must be showing up as map. Let's see what happens if I just do this. Hmm. 
<laughs> kind of hard to get the uh, the dot 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 showing. This is one thing I find annoying is why it shortens this to dot 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 kind of thing. It happens kind of almost randomly. Other times you'll see the full full thing out. But anyway, that's what it's meant to do. It's supposed to let you click on a button and you get a, a map window. So let's get rid of the chart window. Uh, let's see. Um, ba -ba -bum. So that was adding chart window. And you can add a private window. And as you can see, it's it's a main map, but it's in a private window. And when we add that, it basically gives us another main map as a private window. And you can define it as belonging to a side. So you make it invisible to everyone or visible to everybody. And you get a bunch of options. Reporting options, etc. Now if we do the help on this, what it says in the help is a private window behaves like a normal map window but is designed as belonging to a particular side or sides. The owning sides must correspond to one or more of the sides defined in the definition of player sides. A private window may be hidden from all players or not. Blah blah blah. The visible playing blah blah blah. Both most and keyboard events are ignored. A private window may designate another map window to automatically use the same boards as that other window if left blank, and the private window will use its own set of boards. Uh, other properties are the same as for ordinary map windows. So I guess on certain games you may want to have your own copy of the main playing map for planning and strategy of some sort, and that's what, what, what you would do. Okay, so let's get rid of the private map. Next one down is add a player hand. Belongs to side, visible to all players. Now you notice that this is pretty much the same. As a private window. And if I look at this step by step, I don't actually see any difference. They seem to have the exact same options. And it comes up with the exact same reference manual. So I guess it's just a private window by another name. Now what I've used it for in my own module is I've used it for a player hand and basically what it is it's an area in which you can place items that only you the player or owner of that window can touch modify or move those items in that window now in Starfleet Battles the ship counter is on the map but the damageable ship status sheet or starship data sheet SSD it's the, the, the little piece of paper that has the picture of the ship in all the boxes, you can place it in your player hand, or SSD area as I've labeled it, and that's where you would assign damage to your ship, instead of having that big piece of paper on the primary playing map. So that's down to private windows and playing hands add a notes window button tooltip icon and a hotkey so if I go in here and 
Oops. Let's do a start. Okay. Notes window, that's what we wanted to look at. Now, what the notes window actually is, is it's a way to do simultaneous actions or to record actions. Now, oops, wrong one. This doesn't really give you any hint or a clue that this is what you're adding, does it? It just says, give it a button text or a tooltip text, and give it an icon, or a hotkey. That's all it gives you. But what it is, it's actually this. It gives you a space where you can write some text defining a scenario. It gives you a window where you can write some text that's visible to everybody. It gives you a place where you can write some text that's only visible to a specific side. And then it gives you a button for delayed. And what the delayed does is it lets you create a note And it will echo to chat when you save it that you've created a message. And it's got an ability to reveal it. So right now, only I, when I click on this, can get to see what is in the text area. My opponent, if he clicks on it, sees nothing in this area. But I can reveal this by clicking reveal and clicking save. It doesn't reveal the content of it, but I can go back up to note or my opponent can, I should say, they can then click on it and they can actually see the content. So as a player, whenever you go in here and click reveal, it's common courtesy to highlight this, copy it, and paste it into text so that your opponent doesn't have to click on the notes button and then on the delay tab and then highlight the item to see it. But that's what this is. But you wouldn't have a clue that that is being added from notes window but that's what it does. And then you have add imported class, which of course you have to know Java programming in order to use. And then we have the last thing here is add a turn counter. And it gives you an advance item and you can dock it to the bar up to cross top and you can go in and you can set and you can configure. And this is the little window for setting it up. So again, your name, your text, your button, all standard stuff, and your tooltip. You've got a button for uh, show and hide via a hotkey. So this window can either pop up or go away by the hotkey. You can define a hotkey for next turn, which we would do instead of hitting that plus. And the same thing for previous hotkey. Instead of clicking the minus, you would do a keyboard shortcut. And then you've got your turn format. And then you got your report format. And you've got your turn label tooltip and your turn label length. So let's take a look at the option variable, fixed, and maximum. This doesn't really give you much of an idea of what this is going to do until you click OK. And then you come in here and you can add a counter, add a list, or add a global hotkey to it. So if we add a counter, description and a property name, turn level, start, increment by, and loop, and add a list, gives us a window where we can list things, and you got your global hockey. So let me show you what I did with this, with the Starfleet Battles. So let me scroll through here and find where I've got my turn counter. Okay, so here's my turn counters, and I've actually got three of them. Because in Starfleet Battles, there's an 8 impulse game, a 16 impulse game, and a 32 impulse game. So what I've done here is I've defined a counter, and then a list. So if I click on this, 
it doesn't show much it just gives you the label if you click on turn you can see it's just basically a start value on an increment level and then you got the impulse and what it does in here let me move this down is this is what we use for the speed chart so if I grab this and move it sideways there so it displays the message and then it calls out impulse 1 and what ships move at that speed impulse 2 and what ships move on that column etc so in Starfleet Battles every time I click plus it goes from one to the next to the next to the next to the next and displays those messages and you notice here it's got allow players to hide items and allow players to change which item goes first and both are deselected now that's what we do here for a turn counter now I've used the same functionality to define something called the sequence of play which we have right here so it's the same options but then we have a subphase list and here they are able to hide items and it basically lists the sequence in which the game occurs so in Starfleet Battles you do movement then you have a cloak stage you then have an ability to tractor you then have a launch stage and then we've got other stages where other weapons can fire uh, you have a shield operations stage, another stage where a specific race's weapon can fire. You have a transporter stage, um, etc., 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 until you're down to the fire stage and web solidifies. So again, it basically toggles through each of these items in order, and both of them use what's called the turn counter. Even though one is being used not to count turns, but actually neither one of them are being used to count turns one's being used to call a movement list and the other one's being called to, to call out a sequence of playlist neither are actually being used as a turn counter but you can also mark it as a turn counter turn one has been played turn two has been played turn three has been played etc now the one item I haven't used on the turn counter is the global hotkey but again if every turn let's say you're on some sort of a Pac-Man game, board game, and at the beginning of every turn the ghosts get moved back into the corral at the beginning. That could be set up with a global hotkey. So when you advance the turn counter, bang, all the ghosts go back to the, the middle of the map. So that's an example of what you can use for a global hotkey. There are other, other ways of doing it. Um, so you've got the counter and you've got the list. pretty easy to understand and that's the end of the list of items for this very long video so I'm going to end this video here this is much longer than I meant it, it to be I should have actually broken it up into uh, the first four items the next four items etc but anyway um, pretty long one and for the next video I'm going to go back and I'm going to look at the actual traits for the single pieces. So, see you next video.